Hello! Today I'm looking at a seminal contribution to the sandbox gaming genre, and the fifth numerical instalment to Bethesda's sprawling Elder Scrolls series. Initially released in 2011, Skyrim has persevered as an immersive, go-to gaming experience to this day, and sustained by the advantages of high definition and VR re-release, along with the obligatory mod freedom Bethesda permits with its products, it's safe to say interest will be maintained in the title, at least until Elder Scrolls VI rolls around. Having recently discussed Skyrim's immediate predecessor, Oblivion, in much the same way, I'm going to pick up where I left off and delve into the themes, setting, and story and gameplay of Skyrim and consider what distinguishes it, not only within the Elder Scrolls mythology, but also its contemporaries of gaming today, with which it still successfully competes. So, jumping right in, the enormity of Elder Scrolls makes it hard to know where to start a cohesive discussion, but for many, the reveal of a new location and setting is often the initial attraction and allure of the game world, and exploring a new culture and region is the foundation for player engagement and immersion in the world of the Elder Scrolls. In the case of Oblivion, we discovered Cyrodiil as the hub of empire, a metropolitan cultural melting pot analogous to ancient Rome, complete with an emperor, Latin naming, polytheistic religion, and a fighting arena comparable to the Roman Colosseum. Shifting northwards now to the province of Skyrim, we find a radical departure from the multicultural, commercial and sunny hub of Cyrodiil, and into the harsh, mountainous regions of the Nords, who, much like the Imperials borrowing historical elements of ancient Rome, draw on real-world aspects of Celtic and Scandinavian aesthetic, folklore and history, particularly the tail end of the Migration Age, which saw the emergence of conquesting cultures such as the Vikings, and later fiercely independent countries in the flux of civil war, such as 14th century Scotland, which I'll touch on later on. Now, aesthetically, and aside from obvious graphical improvements, Skyrim is completely divorced from the warm, summery hues of Cyrodiil, and instead opts for cool, earthy tones with plenty of streams, mountains, rain and snow, which conveys the geographical and cultural departure from Cyrodiil beautifully. Sandstone and Mediterranean pillared structures of the capital have been replaced by the cold grey masonry reminiscent of the Dark Ages, and forests of hardy evergreens populate the region, rather than the exotic shrubbery of the south. This cold, harsh atmosphere is excellently realised, and from the moment we flee Helgen at the beginning of the game, we're thrown into an immersive game world which plays host to Nordic crypts packed with undead, sprawling mountains and woodland, and of course dragons, around which much of the story hinges. Beyond the geography, and perhaps more importantly, we have the culture of the Nords, which is the foundation of both the societal conditions we find ourselves in, and the politically tense storyline of Skyrim. And as I touched on in my Oblivion review, what Bethesda does really well across its Elder Scrolls series is thread historical narratives, events, and allegiances and rivalries across each game and time period, creating a sort of cohesive mythology for us to follow. In this instance, we have the Imperials of Cyrodiil, who we previously allied with in the events of Oblivion, who now, 200 years later, find their historic occupation of Skyrim under threat, brewing the beginnings of the Civil War with the nationalistic Stormcloaks on the one hand and the Imperial allied Jarls on the other. Now, Skyrim is pretty interesting in this regard because it posits neither the Empire or the Stormcloaks as a more righteous party, but rather, depending on who you speak to and your own opinions, these will inform how you feel about these respective combatants and ultimately it's down to player preference as to whether you ally to the Imperial occupation or the pursuit of Skyrim's independence, helmed by Ulfric. Looking at historical analogues here, where the Imperials are clearly inspired by the Roman Empire, and in this particular context, the Roman expansion into Germania and Britannia during the first century, the Stormcloaks and their relationship to Jarl leaders in the region is strongly reminiscent of other occupied nations throughout history, and particularly, in my opinion, 14th century Scotland. The Scottish element, however, comes through in several other ways too. Firstly, looking at the geography of Skyrim as a wintry, harsh province in the north of an empire, we could argue it's similar to Scotland's climate and geographical location compared to England. 
Additionally, natural wonders, such as the Throat of the World being the highest mountain in Tamriel, is equally similar to Ben Nevis in Scotland being the highest mountain in the British Isles. But most importantly, we have the politics of the time and the personality of Ulfric Stormcloak, which in my opinion heavily references the events of um, Scotland during the Middle Ages, and I'll proceed to delve into this now. Now, there's plenty of historical figures and movements that stood up against larger tyranny that we could reference here. Owain Glinda of Wales, who fought the English expansion in the 1300s, uh, Boudicca, who stood up against the Roman invasion of Britannia, and even George Washington and Sam Adams, who steered America towards independence in the 18th century. But looking at the specifics of the Stormcloak Rebellion, the division among the Jarls, and in particular Ulfric Stormcloak and his relentless pursuit of independence and personal power, this is strongly referential and, and there's a strong comparison to be made here with the events of the first Scottish War of Independence and Robert the Bruce, who was the King of Scotland, who campaigned against the English during this period. Now, the, the division of allegiances between Robert the Bruce and independence on the one hand, and the Hammer of the Scots, King Edward I of England, on the other, was something that divided the Scottish barons and regions during this time. And in much the same way, we have the Jarls of Skyrim becoming divisive with infighting between Ulfric's claim on the one hand, and the Empire under regional command of General Tullius on the other. This conflict between the Jarls and allegiances serves as a pivotal aspect of narrative, with a prime example being the Greybeard's council meeting, where the two sides are finally meeting to air their grievances, and the Dragonborn's decision tree of answers once again steers favour towards one or the other of these rivals, which is down to player preference. <laughs> Beyond this surface-level observation of the relationship between the Jarls and their respective leaders, however, we have other comparable instances from the events of Scottish independence, such as the murder of Red John Conwyn, the, the Guardian of Scotland, which is very similar in narrative construction to the death of Torrig, uh, the High King of Skyrim, who we don't actually see in the game, but just prior to the events of Skyrim, um, Ulfric kind of kills this guy. So, with regard to the former... While Robert the Bruce was vying for independence and building support from his countrymen, a significant obstacle to his aims was the Conwyn family, and particularly Red John, who had inherited the guardianship of Scotland from the infamous Braveheart William Wallace. Now, unlike Wallace or Robert, Conwyn was close to the English crown and well-connected with nobles in both England and Scotland, which put him at odds with Robert the Bruce, particularly because both had a legitimate claim to the kingship of Scotland. So without delving too far into it, the upshot of the situation is, is that after years of feuding, Robert ultimately succeeded in his claim to the throne and his pursuit of independence by personally murdering Red John at a meeting in, in a church in Dumfries, eradicating a rival and any potential English allegiances in the process. Now, turning to Skyrim, Comparatively, we have Torig, who was the High King of Skyrim, and he had considerable support uh, for and from the Empire. And this character proves entirely at odds with Ulfric's nationalistic agenda. And much like the case of Robert and Red John, Ulfric personally murders Torig at a meeting in his own throne room, in an effort to weaken imperial support in the region, and maintain his own momentum as a liberator and a leader of the people of Skyrim. So, to conclude on this point, uh, this politically tense storyline is reminiscent of some brutal historical events that actually happened and forged what would go on to become the United Kingdom. And I think it's a really nice framework around which much of the game hinges and, and you know, these clear historical analogues we could potentially reference it with. And just considering Skyrim specifically now, I always think it's an interesting subject of discussion as to whether people choose to side with Ulfric or the Empire, because opinions to this day, um, you know, they differ quite radically between them. And Ulfric's counterpart, General Tullius, is often considered by fans, uh, you know, this level-headed, pra pragmatic comparison to Ulfric, and a somewhat fatigued warrior 
bureaucrat who, much like Julius Caesar during his campaigns in Britain, has just become tired of being stationed, you know, up north in the middle of nowhere, you know, on the fringes of the empire. Anyway, uh, beyond the analogues to Scottish independence, there's also a much clearer Scandinavian heritage to Skyrim's aesthetic and mythology. The naming conventions, the boats, the gods, the attire, and even the very ethnic designation of Nord is analogous to North Germanic and Scandinavian Norsemen, and particularly the Vikings of the Migration Age. The durable, heavy-drinking warrior culture of the Nords is rooted in this real-world folklore and mythology of the region, and there's many stark examples, such as the underworld of Nord belief, Sovngarde being very similar in form and function to the Norse Valhalla, where in both cases deceased warriors will feast and drink and fight alongside their ancestors and heroes and warrior gods. Exploring this a little further, Skyrim also hosts creatures that have a close relationship with Norse mythology and wider Celtic and Western European folklore. In particular, we have giants, known as Jotnar in Norse mythology, from which Odin is descended, and Thor and Freya frequently encounter in battle. In European folklore, by comparison, we have Jack the Giant Killer, who was later repurposed for children as Jack and a Beanstalk, which is a story of obscure origin but it does correspond to Skyrim's portrayal of, of giants as nomadic, covetous, and aggressively territorial creatures. Further to giants, we have wolves, and in particular werewolves, which are inherently bound up with the Norse pantheon. Loki's child, Fenrir, is perhaps the most famous example of a wolf from this mythological pantheon, but we also have skulls and wargs, which are prototypical werewolves, which run parallels to Skyrim's focus on the creatures, particularly witnessed in side quests, such as the Companions. And finally, another significant creature with regard, and with regards to Skyrim, a, a pivotal creature that's featured in Norse and wider Celtic, English and Germanic folklore, is of course the dragon. Now, of course, dragons feature across Indian, Hebrew, Eastern and various other cultural and religious histories, but the type depicted in Skyrim, unlike the wingless Chinese dragon or the whale-like biblical Hebrew dragon, for example, are exemplary of the creatures found in Arthurian, Germanic and Scandinavian legends. Prime examples of the European dragon is the red dragon depicted on the flag of Wales, which derives from an ancient mythology of a red dragon fighting a white dragon, prophesizing either the defeat of the Saxons or the coming of King Arthur, depending on what version of this tale you read. We have the patron saint of England, who is St George, who is renowned for the infamous George and the Dragon story, in which George kills the eponymous dragon and you know, saves the people of, of the town. And we have tales such as Beowulf, which is an English Scandinavian tale of the eponymous hero who battles and ultimately kills a proud and gold-hoarding dragon which influenced numerous later tales in, in, the Western, in the Western literary movement, such as Smaug in, in J.R.R. Tolkien's hugely influential novel The Hobbit. Now, in Skyrim, the dragons are closely associated with not only the player character, which I'll touch on shortly, but also the religious backdrop for the Nords, with significant gods such as Alduin being a creator and destroyer god within the Nordic belief system. Alduin's role as the bringer of the apocalypse, or world eater, as the Nords call him, is remarkably similar to the dragon god of Norse mythology, uh, Jorgenmander, or the Midgard serpent, as it's otherwise known. Now, this dragon is the child of Loki, who grew so large that it encompassed the entire world and began eating its own tail. And within this giant circle that it created, it contained the lands and seas, which incidentally became known as the mystic symbol known as the Ouroboros, in which various real-world religion and cults actually, you know, subscribe to. But the similarity with Alduin is that where Alduin is prophesied as the destroyer of worlds, likewise, when the Midgard Serpent finally breaks its circle, this is when the fated event of Ragnarok is supposed to arrive, which is the Norse war said 
to end the worlds of gods and men. So, again, just to wrap up on this brief point, the focus on creatures such as werewolves, giants and dragons in Skyrim is highly referential to European and Scandinavian legend and uniquely posits this game with a tone divorced from the high fantasy elements of, of Morrowind and the Latin vibes of Cyrodiil. Now, before moving on to story and gameplay, I'd like to make a brief note on the final, and I think sub- subtly significant, movement at work in Skyrim, which is that of the Thalmor. Beyond the Civil War and the Dragonborn scenarios, which are prominent facets of story, we have this enigmatic and mistrustful elven sect, which is at work behind the curtain, pulling the strings on various scenarios to pursue their own agenda, which is actually much more significant than first than it first seems, because prior to the events of Skyrim, the Thalmor have come off the back of a huge war um, that has essentially forced the Empire into a treaty, and much like the Germanic Visigoths who crippled the Roman Empire towards the, the end days of Rome, the Imperials have been left a shadow of their former self, basically, and you know, in the wake of this elven aggression, the Thalmor have a lot more say in the political machinations of what's going on in Tamriel. So the Thalmor are interesting additions to the game that, firstly, draw on this stereotype of elves being lofty, slightly arrogant and superior beings to humans, such as we see, again, in, in Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. But also, they introduce an element of religious and political extremism to the story that mirrors other tyrannical aspects of history, such as the murmurings of fascism and fascist occupation across Europe in the early 20th century, right before they became full-blown superpowers in Germany and Italy, and arguably Spain and Portugal under Franco and Salazar. So, cultural, religious and political persecution through sabotage and misinformation is at the forefront of the Thalmor agenda in Skyrim and it's similar to aspects of European history such as the Night of the Long Knives in 1934 which precipitated the Nazis' foothold in Germany and I think the Thalmor's sly and subtle agenda in the region such as installing Arcano at the College of Winterhold to name but one example is analogous to these political coups that we've seen throughout history and prove an interesting tertiary antagonism to the main game events. But also, cleverly, I think, they are the ones that are actually fostering this turmoil between Imperial and Stormcloak, you know, primarily by banning the worship of Talos. So, arguably, in fact, it is the Falmor who can be considered a central antagonist in the background of this game. So, in all, I think, Their extremist ideology, which is based around superiority and purification, is a really interesting supplementary plotline that I'd be interested to see explored and and how this pans out in subsequent games and materials to see, you know, assuming that later games are going to be set in the future, how the Thalmor do manage to manifest or not in in Tamriel in days to come. So that about wraps up uh, the setting and the context of the game. So let's shift focus now to the story and the events of Skyrim. True to form with previous games and in classic Elder Scrolls fashion, the player character begins in a state of confinement which funnels them into a narrative and gameplay onboarding segment during an escape sequence. The consistent reliance on an introductory imprisonment scenario has come under fire from many fans in the past, particularly in Oblivion, but as I noted in my Oblivion review, I feel that the ambiguity of the situation in Skyrim, in which nobody knows who the player is or who they're allied to or where they've even come from, provides an ample blank slate of personality for the player to project their own intentions and and story onto. Indeed, the opening moments, you know, riding the wagon into Helgen, it feels like we've been arbitrarily picked up and detained by the Imperials and we simply could have been in the wrong place at the wrong time, which avoids any overt negative connotation for our character. But where many have criticised this introduction, I think it was quite important because what we have immediately from the outset is someone allied to the Stormcloaks and someone allied to the Imperials, instantly establishing this dichotomy and the political turmoil of, of the narrative that we're in. 
Now, this narrative onboarding segment, I think it is well, quite well crafted through the dialogue. On the one hand, we have Raloff, a Stormcloak prisoner who's facing execution, and he contextualizes events through discussing Ulfric and his impassioned cause, you know, from the outset. But we also have Hadvar, a Nord Imperial soldier who, rather than appearing colonial and domineering, is actually a well-meaning, level-headed representative of the military, who, unlike his commanding officer, who just wants to kill everybody, he shows considerably better intentions towards the player character. The fact that Hadvar and Raloff seem to know one another is also very interesting, because it instantly frames the internal dichotomy that's tearing Skyrim apart, with the nationalism of the Stormcloaks on the one hand, and the firmly rooted influence and benefits of Empire on the other. And as I've previously mentioned, which of these forces you choose to perceive as good or bad is entirely down to you and, you know, the individual, the player. And it's an ongoing subject of discussion among fans in, in forums and, and whatnot to this day. So from Helgen, we're thrown right into the action with an appearance from Alduin. And this is a momentous moment for Elder Scrolls, as the build-up and expectation of dragons was a huge boon for the series and something that sought to distinguish its gameplay and in-game region, you know, Skyrim in general, from previous titles. And for my part, I feel the aesthetics, the audio and the role of the dragons in the story was brilliantly realised. And from this opening moment, Alduin is firmly posited as a force to be, you know, contended with. Further to this, the lore surrounding the dragons was also really well done, in my opinion, with the role of the greybeards and the unique shout abilities Bestowed, uh, bestowed upon the player being really cool additions to the game that I honestly think Bethesda will have to work hard to live up to in subsequent entries if only because using unrelenting force to throw people from high places is a great source of entertainment so anyway following Helgen we're introduced to aspects of gameplay such as crafting and smithing at the village of Riverwood and you know it's here that we can also recruit the wood elf um, Fyandel as our first follower, if so desired. And I really like Riverwood because it's this neat intermission between c continuing our main quest line at Whiterun or pursuing a variety of side quests to further explore and acclimatise and level our character and just immerse ourselves in this beautiful wintry region that we're now inhabiting. At this juncture, I should also mention the Jeremy Soul soundtrack, which, of course cannot be understated in how it introduces the emotive, limitless feeling of the game. And running down that hill from Helgen towards Riverwood, you know, overlooking the woodland landscape for the first time is an unforgettable opening moment that's augmented by this fantastic sound design that Soul has consistently delivered to the series, you know, in my opinion. So the next significant character we're introduced to in, in terms of narrative is uh, Balgruff, the the Jarl of Whiterun. And he's an interesting contribution to the political situation because his allegiance remains unclear and somewhat aloof towards what's going on around him. And instead, he's narrowed his allegiance down to the stewardship of Whiterun and basically the best interests of his people. As such, he's a great character to introduce at this juncture because it neither skews the bias for political events towards one or the other of the main belligerents. The Jarl is also integral to directing the Dragonborn towards the Greybeards and explaining the very significance of the Dragonborn within Skyrim lore. As such, he's quite a likeable peripheral character that bestows a great deal of narrative context on us and periodically guides and rewards us in the main questline. On a purely subjective note of, of this part, uh, opening part of the game, White Run and Dragon's Reach are among my favourite locations in Skyrim, as, you know, I think it's a nostalgic thing, but with most first cities that you encounter in an RPG or a JRPG game, they generally persist as among the most memorable and, and weighted uh, with nostalgia. You know, trading at the Drunken Huntsman, unearthing the family feud between the Greymanes and the Battleborns, and performing side quests for the Jarl, to, to name but a few, are great game elements, and Whiterun itself 
you know, being a more neutral and temperate location has a bright and comparatively warm aesthetic compared to some cities on the frozen fringes of the region, such as Winterhold. Now, the next stage of the game comes once we've slayed our first dragon and absorbed its soul on the outskirts of Whiterun. The Greybeards reach out to us, and we come to realise the second common trope of the Elder Scrolls series, which is that our player character is a chosen one, and the saviour of all mankind. I mean, personally, I don't mind this so much, and in this case, the player character relationship to dragons and the shout abilities are fantastic story devices that kind of validate it and make it fun. But I can understand why this might be criticised by some longer-term fans of the games, particularly those from, you know, the Morrowind days and beyond, because it's something that we've seen before, and like the imprisonment scenario at the beginning, it seems to be a, a recycled plot element from, from Bethesda. But on the flip side, you know, is there equal value and intrigue to having an average Joe, accidental hero type of character, you know, that takes centre stage? You know, I'm I'm not sure, I think it's a question, and these people that criticise the saviour, you know, chosen one angle, uh, I don't know what they would rather see in the place of that. Um, but because The Elder Scrolls is a series that deals heavily around the idea of fate, and indeed, you know, an Elder Scroll artefact is a document that foreshadows events of the future and past, it makes sense that we kind of pick up and play as significant contributors to the the sprawling, you know, historical narrative of Tamriel and these kind of pivotal events and cultural paradigms in its history, rather than someone who has comparatively little claim on, on these, you know, pivotal cultural moments in, in Tamriel's history. Anyway, turning to the Greybeards, these guys are integral to the central questline and work as a form of guidance and tutelage for the Dragonborn, which, despite the aforementioned leanings towards Scandinavia, really remind me of the oracles of ancient Greece, which used to be visited in pilgrimage and sought out for advice on important matters. As such, their monastery, High Hrothgar, could be considered analogous to the sanctuary at Delphi in Greece, which travellers would venture to in order to converse with these mystics. Much closer to the influences I discussed earlier, we have rooted in Welsh history and Arthurian legend the character of Merlin, who, similar to the Greybeards, was a mystic advisor and tutor to King Arthur. There's also an interesting link in that Merlin was said to have been conceived by a demon and a nun, which ingrains this dichotomy of good and bad within, within him. Likewise, the Greybeards, although humans, utilise the dragon voice and adhere to the dragon Parthenax, which equally immerses them in this paradox between good and bad, with their guidance of humans, but immersion in the history and lore of the dragons. Once the Greybeards have been introduced to the story, there's a fair amount of back and forth between various side quests and the learning of new dragon shouts. Even among the most committed of Tamriel explorers, however, the fast travel function comes in handy here, because High Hrothgar is a frustrating and somewhat laborious climb to do, more than once or twice in the game. But nonetheless, it's a decisive location for many aspects of the main quest line, such as later in the game, when the council convenes to discuss terms between the Stormcloaks and the Imperials. Now, once the Greybeards send us to fetch the Horn of uh, Jürgen Windcaller, we're introduced to the character of Delphine at Riverwood. And once again, evidence of the Elder Scrolls threading neatly together in terms of history and lore across its games, Delphine reveals to us that she is attempting to revive the dwindling and now outlawed uh, Order of the Blades, who featured prominently in the events of Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion, set 200 years prior to Skyrim. The Blades of Skyrim proved to be a shadow of their former grandeur, and where they were an elite Praetorian guard to Tiber Septim, and we learn that prior to their amalgamation into the Empire, they were an elite order of dragon hunters, who, much like the Teutonic and Templar orders of the Crusades, were formed for a singular purpose, which is basically to slay dragons and protect travellers and people. So Delphine is understandably a somewhat prickly character with a strong distaste of the Thalmor and, of course, dragons. 
She's quite a divisive character with fans, and later in the game she forces the player into some unwelcome choices, including essentially siding between the Greybeards and the Blades. Her counterpart, Esbern, is not so prickly as he is paranoid and cautious, and so both of these surviving Blades convey the Falmore persecution and the disbandment of the Order perfectly, in my opinion. For his part, Esbern is certainly the more amicable of the two, and throughout the middle act of the game, these characters propel the narrative forward with a number of primary and secondary quest lines. So, in all, they're an interesting centrepiece for the game, and where the politics see a split between you know, the Stormcloaks and the Imperials, the centre story also sees a divisive split between key quest givers in the form of the Greybeards and the Blades respectively. And once again, it's another prevailing discussion occurring between Elder Scrolls fans as to who they side with and why, with particular argument being hinged around Delphine, who forces the issue by requesting that you kill Parthenax, which you do or or don't have to do, uh, depending on, on your allegiances here. Now, as the questline develops, we see increasingly fantastical events, locations and characters come to pass, And one thing I've always really liked about the Elder Scrolls is that it entertains the belief systems and religions of Tamriel by having them as tangible locations and characters. A primary example here is the Daedra, who appear in most, if not every game. And in the instance of Skyrim, we have the Nord god Alduin serving as a central antagonist and the afterlife of Sovngarde as the conclusive location in the main questline. The appearance of Alduin and his resurrection of dragons across the region is the centrepiece of Skyrim's story and its uniqueness within the Elder Scrolls series to date. And for my part, I think he was a great antagonist to orientate the plot around. And giving the dragons a sentience and a language, you know, to hang this mythos around, really augments them beyond what could have merely been creatures senselessly flying around trying to eat people. Which, admittedly, getting down to some of the less important dragons, it's essentially what they do. But Alduin gives this sense of purpose to this, um, as it's foretold, as this apocalyptic, you know, extinction event. With respect to his role as a destroyer and a rebirther, it somewhat reminds me of the Hindu god Shiva, um, who's known as Shiva the Destroyer. And Shiva's role was likewise to oversee the destruction of the world so that Brahma, the creator, could build it anew. And another thing I like about Alduin being a Nord analogue of Akatosh and the Argonian Atakota is that it sort of mimics this real world evolution of religions which dissect and develop and focus on specific aspects of faith and specific avatars over the course of time. But they essentially root back to a common denomination in origin, with classic examples being the Abrahamic religions and the um, syncretism of Far Eastern religions, in which, you know, they will kind of interrelate to some degree. So let's shift focus now, and right before we move into the gameplay and design of Skyrim, I'd just like to note uh, on the supplementary quests, guilds, and story arcs that there is a wealth of unique content to engage with, and where earlier titles, by necessity and limitation, seemed to repeat themselves with many of the side quests, Skyrim is a pretty decent step towards, you know, evolving this. The recurring Fighters Guild and Mages Guild don't find their way into the storyline of Skyrim, the former being due to the presence of the companions who predate and negate the necessity of a Fighters Guild operating in the province, and the latter being due to the dissolution of the Mages Guild, in the wake of the Oblivion Crisis of the fourth game, which basically the um, the mages were held responsible for the Oblivion Crisis. So instead, we have the Autonomous College of, of Winterhold hosting the magical side quests and developments. Both the Companion and the College side quests, along with the Thieves Guild, um, which is situated in Riften, have great story arcs that permit player input and decision trees, the likes of which Elder Scrolls has never before offered with its side quests. And rather than repeating radiant quests, each guild has a unique arc that culminates in some interesting options, and perhaps the oddest being the potential to become a werewolf. Uh, 
Another returning guild is the Dark Brotherhood, and as I mentioned in my Oblivion review, while the story arc of the Dark Brotherhood is interesting, with Astrid and Cicero being solid characters, if somewhat bizarre with regards to the latter, the whole requirement to cleanse the guild at the apex of the side quest is too reminiscent of the Oblivion version for some people, and I've previously discussed the potential for an income-based guild management dynamic that could benefit the natural conclusion and and you know movement into leadership you know of these side quests rather than simply becoming the boss and then having nothing much happening further quests and particularly the dragon priests and the daedric quests are also great additions to the game with the latter being probably my favorite in skyrim owing to the unique stories the weird daedric gods we interact with and of course the artefacts that we acquire from each successful completion. Now, let's turn to the gameplay and design of Skyrim, and one thing that's probably quite a weird observation, but was the first thing I noticed in the game coming off the back of Oblivion, was that the third-person view has shifted slightly to sit closely over the right shoulder of the player character, and this is particularly noticeable when you're unarmed. Um, And I found it quite strangely disorientating. Firstly, because previous games tended to centre the camera and sit, you know, directly behind the character. And also possibly because I'm left-handed, so I'm used to the dominance and the focus on the other side of the anatomy, which is probably just me talking rubbish. But um, let's face it, many consider it sacrilegious to play Elder Scrolls in the third person anyway, but it's just an immediate observation that I found with the game. The next thing that's quite apparent of the gameplay is that the handling and the design is much more harmonious with console gaming, and indeed this is the first Elder Scrolls that I've owned for the console rather than PC, and the renewed focus on consoles has come under some fire from sections of the fanbase owing to the fact that PC permitted much more freedom, such as flying potions and ridiculous things that you could do in there, along with the custom input from gamers, should they so, so choose and a a console log to get yourself out of some ridiculous dead ends as well, which was useful. That said, the handling and the mechanics of gameplay are greatly improved, and similar, I think, to the Fallout series in some ways, where we've got these execution cutscenes and aesthetically pleasing battle actions that reward successful combat, and they're a far cry from the monotonous hack and slash of oblivion and the randomized battle mechanics of morrowind which let's face it as much as i love those games were just painful to sit through at times so you know even the sound design uh, you know of battle in skyrim from the the melee weaponry to the hiss and the sizzling effects of spell casting you know it gives this dynamism and tangibility to the setting and it's excellently done i absolutely love the sounds of the spells in this game New and unique aspects of gameplay include marriage, purchasing a home, gaining followers, and advanced crafting, cooking, and alchemy functions, to name but a few. And starting with the latter, much like the aforementioned battle effects, there was a real dynamism to the crafting functions, which, unlike most other games, which feature synthesis gameplay um, in a menu, you're actually watching your avatar crafting weapons and armor, which was really nice you know, rather than just fusing elements arbitrarily in a in a menu interface. So again, it, it adds this atmosphere and immersion and tangibility to what Skyrim offers here. Regarding followers and marriage, these aspects of the game are mainly aesthetic and seem more like experimental blueprints that later titles will embellish and develop, or at least hopefully so. The followers in particular are at the moment only partially useful, but they are varied, and there's many of them, which is quite cool. The drawback is that they're limited in dialogue and purpose, other than being battle additions and basically pack horses for your items. But they also have a frustrating habit of dying quietly off screen or disappearing, which leads to all manner of frustration if they're carrying stuff that you actually really want, um, or if you simply like having them around. <laughs> 
So these pockets of non-essential gameplay, such as pursuing a wife and crafting crazy items, it really augments the immersion and the pseudo-reality of Skyrim, and also adds greatly to the longevity and replayability of the game, I think. The next facet of gameplay worth noting, which is inherent to each Elder Scrolls game, is what I call the moral mechanics of the series, which is to say the freedom of the sandbox setting allows you to be either a benevolent do-gooder or a psychopathic murderer, depending what type of game you want to play. Now, these moral mechanics aren't baked into the gameplay to the same extent as games such as Mass Effect, wherein your good actions or you know, bad actions will influence plot abilities and decision trees. But in Skyrim, your willingness to do good or bad is certainly reflected in NPCs' attitudes towards you, and it's an interesting subtext that the player you know, has this opportunity di- to dictate what kind of person they want to be on each playthrough. And speaking of freedom, probably the last core facet of gameplay worth mentioning is the levelling system, which, rather than being dictated by job classes and predefined star signs like in earlier titles, this has been opened right out into a sprawling astrology chat that permits players to pick and choose levelling and perks based on their playstyle. And on this note, to digress slightly, I really like the renewed focus on a minimal menu design and loading screens that are just, you know, they work with this straightforward black background and white text. And it's just really straightforward, stripped-backed, minimal UI that I love. And although Morrowind and Oblivion's attempt at realism through skeuomorphic parchment-style menus and handwritten typography, it was a nice attempt at immersion, But going back to those games, it's really easy to see how these have become quite dated and difficult to navigate through by today's standards, at least without the additions of of, of mods and things like that. So there's plenty of features and intricacies that I could delve into regarding Skyrim's gameplay. You know, dual wielding, uh, shouts and perks are all examples of small elements that contribute to a greater whole, much like the radiant quests and, and side quests that populate the game. But instead, I'd like to shift finally now onto the music and composition of Skyrim and Jeremy Soule's soundtrack for the game, which many regard as his magnum opus, at least to date, with his Elder Scrolls games. And it's only natural that as the Elder Scrolls games grow in praise and popularity, the budgets will increase and better technology permits better sound. And in the case of Skyrim, it's well known that Soule was able to utilise a live choir and certain orchestral arrangements to weave in with his digital accompaniments at times, which makes Skyrim so audibly dynamic. There's also a much more culturally appropriate sound regarding the wintry Nordic region of the place, and when you're sheltered in the comfort of a pub or an inn or a shop, there's some comforting lute tracks such as Winter's Tale, Bannered Mare, and Around the Fire, which compound this feeling of a warm hearth, you know, drinking mead, for example. By comparison, while exploring the sprawling vistas, there's some excellent soundtracks that, though new, somehow convey a sense of nostalgia and wonder immediately. And for my part, uh, Far Horizons, Streets of Whiterun, and City Gates particularly stand out as compositions that never cease to amaze me when it comes to playing this game, or simply listening to music in general, because I find them quite replayable and and returnable, you know, compositions to go back to. And digressing slightly and going slightly off topic, and without wishing to sound like I'm complaining, I find it interesting that many quote marks, aficionados of classical music, with roots in Brahms or Beethoven or Bach, tend to dismiss the likes of Jeremy Soul out of hand simply because they're video game composers. In the UK particularly, uh, I listen to a radio station called Classic FM, which ranks composers yearly in a top 100. And many listeners of the show were causing controversy and threatening to boycott their, their, their viewership um, of the radio station because Jeremy Soul and the Final Fantasy composer Nobuo Yamatsu keep making the top 10 like every year and this absolutely disgraced outraged these people um, that a classical radio program would permit them 
to you know enter the top 10 let alone play them and give them airtime so for my part i can't help but think whoever these people are have never even attempted to listen to jeremy soul before writing him off because you know i'm a fan of classical music you know i, I love mozart and vivaldi and handel and i honestly put jeremy soul and and some of these scores that he's come up with on a par with these seminal works by these classic composers so I really don't understand the drama there and I don't know why I've gone off on this on this point but I figured I'd raise it anyway as we're talking about Jeremy's soul anyway uh, to conclude on the audio in my opinion the score from the moment you load up the game and hear the dramatic choir piece of Dragonborn to the moment you reach Sovngarde it's a beautiful beautiful atmospheric accompaniment to the ex- exploration and the quest lines of Skyrim. So that about wraps up my thoughts on this game. Skyrim has proved a worthy successor to the equally ambitious Oblivion and has set a weighty precedent for the Elder Scrolls games to come. Its rooting in Nordic mythologies and analogous cultures and religions crafts a unique but still somehow familiar setting that tugs on the history and the nostalgic myths and legends that we're aware aware of today and this title as i mentioned at the beginning proves a replayable and immersive sandbox game that's been extremely slow to age if at all so what are your thoughts drop a comment start a conversation and if you like what i'm saying please share and subscribe to help my channel grow and as a very final point whether you're a first-time listener or a returning subscriber I've put a link to a short poll and questionnaire in the description, which gives you the opportunity to feed back on my channel and helps steer my content creation and suggestions for the future. So if you have a couple of minutes, it's only five or six questions. um, I'd really appreciate that feedback. 